Madhu, there's so much to ask you. So let me start with one of many seminal interviews that you did, and that was with Yakub Memon, mm -hmm. the only interview of Yakub Memon who was executed. And it occurred to me that if this were all happening today, my sense is nobody would be able to interview a Yakub Memon while in custody and if they did manage the interview they would not broadcast it like i just can't imagine that interview happening today you're can right. you you're right and even if they even if they broadcasted it if at all if they saw it as beneficiary to benef it would benefit the government and they did broadcast it the first thing that would happen would be i'd be attacked at how she got this interview because she has contacts with the terrorists and therefore she is part of the you would be called anti national yes so it wasn't advani saying when he said it is the saddest day of my life we lost control over this crowd you don't believe actually i'll tell you he did my reporter told me that he was with advani ji at that time and advani in his description was that he was like having a nervous breakdown he was wringing his hands and crying and saying kya ho gaya kya ho and you're arguing that that tone did not come down because of the axes and not shovels. Possible. Not possible. And Rao, in your opinion, the Prime Minister of the time and the Chief Minister of the time of Uttar Pradesh had a deal. When we first showed the terrorists on camera, Alpana Kishor did that interview. Um, Mastgul? Was it Mastgul? No, One of Mastgul them was, was later. later. Yeah. But this was just two random guys and who had done some and they were planning and they were doing and all that. So, uh, they gave the interview with uh, the scarf over their faces, but as he got up, he deliberately took it off, you know, as a, an act of defiance. Yeah. Uh, Bhutta Singh was Home Minister at that time, and uh, Farooq Abdullah, who's a friend actually. Yeah. They went to Rajiv Gandhi and said Madhu Train should be arrested, Arun Puri should be arrested. Madhu, there's so much to ask you. So let me start with one of many seminal interviews that you did. And that was with Yakub Memon. Mm -hmm. The only interview of Yakub Memon who was executed uh, for terrorism, uh, for his links with Dawood Ibrahim, for being the brother of Tiger Memon, for his involvement in 1993. You were able to interview him when you were a journalist and founder and editor of news track and we'll talk about news track later but let's talk about Yakub Memon. I was watching the clip of that interview when I was preparing for this conversation and it occurred to me that if this were all happening today my sense is nobody would be able to interview a Yakub Memon while in custody and if they did manage the interview they would not broadcast it like I just can't imagine that interview happening today you're can right. you you're right and even if they even if they broadcasted it, if at all, if they saw it as beneficiary, to, benef it would benefit the government and they did broadcast it, the first thing that would happen would be I'd be attacked at how she got this interview because she has contacts with the terrorists and therefore she is part of the... You would be called anti-national? Yes. Did anyone call you anti-national when you interviewed Yakub Memon? Not at all. Not at all. The whole hangama at that time was why and how did she get it? Who allowed it? That was the hangama. And there was a lot of, frankly, a lot of envy from other journalists who tried to do all kinds of things. But, you know, once you've done the interview, what can they do? Hmm. And uh, so the only hangama was uh, in the journalistic field. But everybody else, for them, it was a story. What does that tell you about what's changed? Many things have changed about journalism and not all have to do with governments some have to do with technology some have to do with the generational work culture and we can talk about all of that but when you agree that an interview like the one you conducted with Yaku Memon could not take place today what does that tell you about the state of media today see it's not just the media it's also the audience yes all right so the audience influences the media in many ways and uh, what I find is that you it's impossible to make a statement whether I make it here or whether I write it in an article or I tweet it, everything is seen through the lens of which side is she on. Yes. Okay. So 
I might tweet something uh, which on issues which I disagree with what is happening uh, and immediately you're stamped that she's pro-Muslim, terrorist, anti-national. And if I tweet something that supports, happens, like I support something that is related to Hinduism, then suddenly I'm a Hindu Bhakt. Yeah. Okay. So I've been accused of both. Yes. Because I go on the issues as they happen. And I think the biggest disservice we have done to ourselves as a people is that we have brainwashed ourselves. We've colored our own eyes. We can't see with fresh eyes. We can't hear with fresh ears. We can't see, read anything without just looking at the content. And they, somehow there's a security in labeling someone. And these labels are very detrimental because most of us who are in journalism, uh, I think when you do a story, it can fall either way. You yeah. don't know which way it's going to go, whether it will be a, a negatively seen by the center or negatively seen by the opposition. Uh, and often the same story is negatively seen by both. Yes, many times. Many times, and in fact. For example, when the UPA was in power, there were no angels. They had passed that section... 69A. Yes, and they put even cartoonists in jail. Mm. They were hounding people. 66A, I think it was. 66A, yes. They were hounding journalists. They, they were doing the same things. All right. In this center, they are also doing it, but in a different way. This is their own characteristic or nature to do it in their style. But I, I don't think that there's ever been a government that, since I've been a journalist, that has been happy with my journalism. <laughs> All right? do, you, do you wear that as a badge of honor? Yes. I, I remember one time when Rajiv Gandhi was uh, first became prime minister and he was doing these breakfast meetings with the media mm. and getting to know us and basically mm. PR job. So I called my brother Arun Puri and I told him that you know he's invited me to breakfast uh, tomorrow morning and he said don't go because once you connect like that socially you can't write. And these are people, Rajiv Gandhi was in my brother's class in Doon School. Mm -hmm. All right. We've known all these at that time that Latians, what we were accused of is true. It was a very elitist, closed, closed social social yeah. everyone had been to school and college together in yeah. some form. We all knew each other since childhood, which includes people like um, Naveen Patnaik, Vasundra Rajya, uh, you, all of the Kamal Nath, all of these people we've known since childhood. Yeah. So there comes a point where you have to just cut it off. Like when Vasundra was in power, when she was chief minister, when I'd go to Jaipur, I would never contact her. I'd never invite her home in Delhi. Mm. But once she's out of power, she said, why didn't you call me? I said, because you're chief minister. I'm sorry, I can't handle it. Mm. Once she was out of power, then fine, I went to see her in Jaipur. Yeah. Then, you know, it's different. But, you know, you're right in saying that uh, every government wants to control media. Uh, but there's something that feels a little bit different about this that moment. And it may also have to do, as you said, with the audience. What I don't remember is feeling this suffocated. Uh, let me give you a small example that happened to me in the last, last few days. On Manipur. Uh, I've been very critical about of the Virin Singh government. Uh, I've been saying the Prime Minister must speak. But I also believe, and I said that I thought that the opposition should have allowed a debate to begin inside parliament when Amit Shah was ready to, to do so because Manipur deserves that. Yes. And therefore, to me, while both political blocs are playing politics, um, the people of Manipur are suffering. To which, uh, on literally the same 24 hours, for one of my reports that was critical of, of the BJP government, the BJP went for me. And the moment I said the opposition should allow the debate, the Congress social media units went for me and said I was getting money from the BJP. Now, one is used to this now, and one tries to grow a thick skin. But do you remember it being this polarized, this suffocating, this label, you know, that impulse to label? Do you, has it always been like that? No, of course not. I mean, really, this is the problem that... But also don't forget that in those days, in... There was no social media. No, that's not... Don't blame everything on social media. Yeah. Um, journalists were not aligned so publicly as they are today. All right. First of all, you start with in the early 90s when the Jain started selling space. When you st and started with the light pages. Then it became in the main paper. Mm. And they weren't concerned about journalism. They 
were doing business as famously said that or notoriously said that I'm just into selling toothpaste and Monique Jen said I don't I'm not interested in journalism I'm only interested in that we are, our business is advertising yeah so when you start with that attitude hmm. you're corrupting you've already corrupted journalism to a degree which is irretrievable today so we can't just say it was social media that did it it was none of these small things I think it's an the inner core of journalism was damaged then mm -hmm. and everybody objected at that time and the gen said all of you will follow and all of them did suddenly we see impact feature you know whatever little small little thing promotion which nobody can see yeah so i think a large part of it is that that uh, journalism started to go downhill from that moment and then also it became acceptable to uh, align yourself for the benefits you get from a political party now we know that journalists have to look for access all right but you don't have to look for access in a corrupt way you don't have to take a plant and just run it the way a political party has given it to mm. to you and, and make benefit from it and one of the things was that when I was editor in the various places that I was and plants would come in my first instruction to the reporter is that is very easy to take a plant but the first question you should ask when you get a plant is why is someone giving me the story that's the story that's the real story so you take the plant and then you investigate why is he planting it against this person yeah let me ask you though you made a comment in journalists were not so openly aligned and i and, and i would agree but some alignments today are foisted on you whether you feel them or not like you said sometimes you're called pro muslim you may be called pro congress and you may be called pro modi and and we all go through this do you think the answer to being a chamcha a sycophant is to be a morcha or an activist because the other thing that's happened now is that there is this contempt almost for people who will respond on issues as opposed to uh, people who may take the other side and say okay i don't like party a so i'm just going to be literally almost like a political activist through my media frankly i think that's very simplistic in this atmosphere mm -hmm. okay because you it's when you are fighting a battle you don't put a target on yourself and say come kill me all right in today's climate i feel that one has to be a little smarter than that i agree all right mm -hmm. and it's like guerrilla warfare now i learned this when reading prayag upper's book mm -hmm. laila he's never mentioned hindutva bjp vhp but he's written about a dy dystopian country mm -hmm. all right you read between the lines you know what he's talking about all right um you see veer das's show i went to see the his comedy act he didn't use any of the words that were identifiable to any political party but he trusted the audience's intelligence because everybody understood who and what he was talking about without even a nudge or a wink it was understood today's writing i think if you really want to understand what this atmosphere is where you are watched on what you're writing and who what they see is what is negative um i think one has to be clever and learn to write between the lines Re write in a way that it, whatever you want to be said can be read between the lines arthur miller's crucible was written during the mccarthy period everybody knew it wasn't about you know uh, 17th century america he set it there or i don't know which century mm. but it was you know behind um, uh, it was um what childishly put in olden days <laughs> so um it was about mccarthyism how everyone in hollywood actors writers screenwriters producers everyone was being harassed by mccarthy and that was why it was written so i think one has to be uh extremely strategic in how one functions in this to get the message across but that's not what we are largely seeing today what we largely seeing today is a very is a polarized media that seems to reflect the polarized politics its labels of left and right uh, hyper nationalist and anti national these are the labels that you hear secular and you know hindutvavadis one of the biggest problems i found in uh, in our country 
is that there is a tendency to never think beyond this a, moment no never think beyond what you've seen and done before everything is repetitive so if you have to do something completely different it's not it's not easy our educational system is a mugging system which is not a bad system because i know my husband did well in america because he mugged up in king george's medical college in lucknow mm. so it's not like i'm putting it down but what happens then it does not encourage uh thinking away from what you've seen and done before for example when i started news track everybody sounded like doordarshan the voice the connotations the pause everything was like doordarshan mm. in fact when i started india today the magazine people were writing victorian english yeah. i had to beat their heads to say write how you speak yeah. don't write this victorian english so there is a tendency in our culture that jo jaise pehle chal raha hai waise jaise hi karte jao so when somebody comes in with a left this thing then that's the only way to go if it's a rightist thing that's the only way to go there are i'm not saying there aren't but there are many creative thinkers in our country we have our intellectuals there's ramu gua there's javed dakta whole lot of host of people but the i think what we need to encourage is for people to think for themselves to be creative in what they do i mean it's a really a purely existential moment because your choices are what's important and you have a choice of how to live and what to become let's other people are making you without you realizing it is the it's actually anti existentialism because the power to be yourself has been taken away by propaganda and politicians and you're just going along with the train i i couldn't agree more but let's start with a disruptive idea that you had and i don't know if today's generation uh, would would remember news track but everybody who no, they don't they don't i have to explain to them what a vhs tape <laughs> is and one of the things that i would say of people my age who have done a lot and frankly been extremely famous that's yes. immodestly uh, said yes but you know i would go to ladakh and somebody would recognize me and I, one of the biggest changes is that now when i go somewhere and i'm going registering myself in the india today conclave and the person doesn't recognize me how does that feel it feels interesting now it can not terrible no because i can see somebody feeling destroyed ki ab mera kya mai kaun hu mai koi koi janta hi nahi hai but you know if you as journalists as you know you don't do your work to become famous of course a scientist doesn't do his work to become famous yeah. you do your work yeah. and if you become famous it's an one of the things that happens okay amongst the many things the access to politicians being being privileged enough to watch history unfolding right in front of you all those are privileges yeah and i think that is one of the things that you lose when you <coughs> move to the next stage yeah so news track the idea of news on a weekly tape that you could subscribe to and get delivered to your home uh and and one of the things i read was very interesting that you did a survey before you launched news track and you asked people i did you, arun did and with you and okay arun i did. i told him i said it's a waste of time he spent 2 lakhs which at that time was a lot of money. of money yeah to do a survey and they were given these uh, this form to answer questions like would you watch news for an hour and i told arun i said if the right brothers had done a survey and said we put you in this contraption and send you up in the air who would have said yes <laughs> yeah you got to just do it because they were used to seeing doordarshan news yeah. they didn't know news could be done the way we did it where you actually saw during the mandal commission as you know riots a student being killed and dragged we caught uh, in rajiv goswami elections uh, yeah exactly rajiv goswami and uh, in mayhem elections a guy being bludgeoned to death on camera at that time so the days of like seeing two students killed in a little line in times of the corner of a paper suddenly everyone was seeing things differently so my i told arun if you're doing a survey like this is because they don't know what we can do yeah now news track had definitive coverage on many important moments of our contemporary history and the demolition of the babri masjid was one of them mm -hmm. and you wrote an article uh, where you spoke about how you felt that no one had ever really got into 
how that dome came down so swiftly that was one of the points you made the other point you made was that you thought lk advani may not have been fully in on you know he was more like an intellectual mascot for the movement may not have been fully in on the plan to bring this dome down and the third point you made was that there was a role of the congress that hadn't been spoken of enough can you look back at that moment and you know yeah, it changed it, india that moment now yes. there's a ram mandir sanctioned by the supreme court that will be opening uh, you know in january of 2024 talk about that story that is see first of all remember that bjp had two seats in parliament yes okay yes this yath yatra which our present prime minister was involved in uh, organizing yes in fact when i went to see him in gandhi nagar about 3 4 years ago he told me that mai aapke office mein aaya tha i was so embarrassed cuz i couldn't remember <laughs> and i don't know how i treated <laughs> him so <laughs> it was a little nerve wracking but um so f- it was a brilliant idea as a as to build a party yeah but it wasn't such a brilliant idea to bring re- in my mind to bring religion into politics because the minute you do that you start playing in a very dangerous field but had religion not been in politics earlier i mean you made you made the point that is now well established that rajiv gandhi opened the locks well before uh, the revolution you know, takes place that was not done as a political uh, construct movement. yeah it wasn't done like you are if you are hindu you have to be follow hindutva and you, and bjp is hindutva bjp arun nehru actually arun nehru not rajiv gandhi so much it was arun nehru who was really quite a cutter hindu as i recall mm. he was the one who got the locks opened mm. all right now the other part where the congress was involved was that narsimha rao was the prime minister he turned his head away he knew exactly what was going i wanted to tell me that he didn't know what was going to happen he knew what was going to happen there was a deal between kalyan singh and him and kick hone do because basically i don't know maybe there was some ideological hindu thing rao? political with rao i don't know i can only guess at that but i do know that he was the prime minister and obviously barkha he could have stopped it yeah. but he didn't all right that's one thing and there's you asked me about the bringing down of the dome if you saw the dome it is a solid structure mm-hmm. all right but it didn't come down with that was a with shovels and axes that was a, an image that everybody saw but what happened as i explained i think in that story uh, when we covered it was there came a moment there were two sets of people one set with orange bands and one with yellow bands and there came a moment when everybody was called off the structure and all the orange bands were chucked out mm. they were asked to leave i remember seeing footage of murli manohar joshi and uh sanghi was his name mm mm-hmm. mm I, I, I'm not sure about the two people in the footage mm. who you could see they were pushing uh pushing all the uh, orange band uh car sevaks out. out yeah and only the yellow ones were left after that that actual footage of the explosion like come on a building goes up or down there has to be rubble debris yeah. smoke yeah. nobody got that because before that just before that they had given the green light to beat up all the journalists so we had footage of a german uh a german reporter being beaten blood streaking streaming down his neck and he's shouting call so and so and this and that and uh, our cameraman also uh, uh they were all beaten and he took out the vhs which we then made a story of and threw it under the charpai of one of the priests in the rooms and went back to retrieve it later but that actual explosion barkha is not possible unless it had been wired with explosives that's my belief hmm so it was prearranged yes and as far as the- so it wasn't advani saying when he said it is the saddest day of my life we lost control over this crowd you don't believe actually i'll tell you he did because he thought that he would go there on this yatra give a few speeches everybody thought that hum speech denge all the leaders the bjp leaders were prepared to give speeches and then just um ye nare do teen laga ke everyone go home peacefully yeah, yeah when but he didn't know that there was another faction in there who planned this whole thing out mm. and when it happened my reporter told me that he was with advani ji at that time and advani in his description was that he was like having a nervous breakdown 
was wringing his hands and crying and saying, "Yeh kya ho gaya? Yeh kya ho raha? Yeh kya?" And you're arguing that that tone did not come down because of the axes and shovels. Not possible. Not possible. And Rao, in your opinion, the Prime Minister of the time and the Chief Minister of the time of Uttar Pradesh had a deal. Why then has the Congress not been held account to held to account? When is the Congress has forget Congress has anyone been held been held accountable? Nobody. You you also make the point about the Labour Party. Not for 1984, not for 2000. Who's been held accountable? No one. Has Brijbhushan been uh, uh, held accountable? His bail was unopposed. That's what I'm saying. Our country, it's. Uh, somehow why we shield people why we don't get to the bottom and hold actually hold people accountable so that people feel that you have to follow the law hmm. but the power of the the hideousness of power that people think they can get away with it news track did seminal work in kashmir uh the discourse around kashmir is also a very altered one what you can and you will show on kashmir today is also very different especially in mainstream media once again it's a very polarizing and polarized conversation how do you look at kashmir today what also happens is one's own for lack of a better word politics changes sometimes you feel more empathetic to an issue and then 15 years later you don't feel the same way intellectually or emotionally How has your journey been in your response to Kashmir as a story and as an issue? I get what you're saying. You know this. You go through these yeah. sort of cycles, but um, when we first showed the terrorists on camera, Alpana Kishore did that interview. Um, Mustgul was it Mustgul? No, One of Mustgul them was, was later. later. Yeah, but this was just two random guys and who had done some, and they were planning and they were doing and all that. So uh, they. Gave the interview with uh, the scarf over their faces, but as he got up, he deliberately took it off. You know, as a an act of defiance. Yeah. Uh, Bhutan Singh was home minister at that time, and uh, Farooq Abdullah, who's a friend actually. Yeah. They went to Rajiv Gandhi and said Madhu Tarain should be arrested, Arun Puri should be arrested. And now this is the difference between an educated guy who understands journalism. Mm. Okay. He just told them to run along. Do you think that has to do with being educated? Yes. Why do you say that? Someone, you know, you immediately be called elitist. I tell you because there is a, I feel there is a Mughal, almost almost a Mughal way of running a country in which, or like say a Bush, George Bush way of running a country, which is either you're with us or against. Yes. Indira Gandhi was educated, and she imposed the emergency. Yes. Uh, was she educated? No. I mean, no. <laughs> she just made it through school. Okay. She never went to college. Mm-hmm. She didn't she go to declared herself to be an. Oh. She went to some finishing school in Switzerland. She never went to. I don't think she went. I think she went to Oxford or Cambridge. That's what I thought. That for she went some to a short period of time where okay. she met. I don't know where she met Faroos and one of these. To me, that's not an educated person. All right. Even if they've been to some dinky college or whatever, an educated person understands the larger horizon. Okay. What did Kennedy do in the Bay of Pigs disaster? He had a he had a speech to give. It had been scheduled before the disaster, and you remember what he said. He said to the press, "You've been critical of us. You were right. We need to hear this, and and I accept." He just actually appreciated the press, the media, t- telling him how wrong. Which Indian happened. leader in recent memory or distant memory has done that? Sorry. Which Indian leader in recent or distant memory has appreciated never, a critical never. media? In fact, you said that. You know the control of the media started, uh, but in my mind, it started when Nehru ad- added that article. The First Amendment. Exactly, because he was used to adulation. Suddenly, people open democracy, new democracy, and there were people, the press, and uh, in Parliament, people people were critical of him. The press was reporting what mm. how he was uh, criticized in Parliament very often by Firoz Gandhi. Mm. and uh, he couldn't handle it let's come back to kashmir you said an educated prime minister and i'll come back to the educated bit later let's first understand so buta singh and farooq abdullah said madhu trehan should be arrested then what happens so then we carried on doing stories in kashmir i mean we got the most rajiv gandhi ignored that yeah, missive yeah. yeah and actually even when we did a negative story about him if i bumped into him at some event or whatever he'd say madhu that was not fair it's not hmm. but It's not that 
it remained that way, right? It's not that if, for example, it was a Congress government, as you yourself mentioned, in, during the UPA years, there was Asim Trivedi, the cartoonist, who, you know, showed Parliament as a toilet bowl. And I should take back that sentence of education. Yeah. Because who could be more educated than Manmohan Singh? Yes. And all this happened on his watch. Yes. Where journalists and other people were being arrested and harassed. Even though I will say in his defense. So I totally take it back. Okay. Let's come back to Kashmir. Let's talk about Kashmir. Uh, how, do you find an altered sentiment about how you would look at that issue? You know, there comes a point. In India or in Kashmir? With, yeah, I mean, Kashmir as, in, as, a, as a part of India, post abrogation of 370, for which there is widespread uh, support even across political parties. Yeah. How does a journalist understand that kind of an issue around which there is so much heightened sentiment? You know, how do you report a story where you may be going against the grain of your audience? I guess that's what I'm asking. In Kashmir, you'll always go against the grain of some, of some audience. Yeah. yeah. So you really can't self-censor yourself or uh, angle your story with a predetermined idea. Yeah. I think that's not good journalism. Yeah. I think... Kashmir is a story to be told now especially because there are changes. Yeah. There are positive changes. I wouldn't, you know, you can't deny that. And um, you see, the interesting part about this government is there's so many things that are done that are, in my mind, difficult to accept, especially as a journalist and when it's done to you. But they've done good things. Hmm. Barkha, when... We, I first started journalism, started going out to villages. When I went to villages, there were only Jhopris. There were Oxfam photograph babies with big bellies, lice in their hair, trachoma in their eyes, worms in their stomach. Mushkil se chaddi bhi pehni hui, walking barefoot in yeah. filth. Yeah. Now you drive through. I didn't see driving from Delhi to through Rajasthan. I didn't see a hut, maybe maybe deeper in the thing, but we could stop on the way at a farmer's home and use their toilet would be clean. You see kids with school bags, school bags, uniforms, happy, it's wonderful. So yes, he's done a lot. There's I have friends who have a home in a village area in Pune and I said, what are you going to do for electricity? He said, don't worry, Modi's done the grid. Okay, so there are many things that uh, in terms of first prime minister to ever speak about toilets mm -hmm. for 70 years a country no written about in by vs naipaul you know what it's like in india to see open defecation wherever you go nobody did anything mm -hmm. so i i think there are things that this government knows how to do and what does it not know how to do how to treat journalists, how to treat the media, how to uh, understand. They really need to understand that a criticism does not bring a government down. Do you not think, building up on that, that some of the wounds... And also, one second, what else should it do? It should respond when there is a crisis, number two. When there's, whether it's Manipur or whether it's Bridgewater, Bhushan, or whether it's anything, when the whole country is embroiled in it and not a word is said. That is bad for the country. It's demoralizing. And Ch thirdly, I think uh, what must be done is acceptance of differences. You know, I mean, dividing the country has, even when they do it, it backfires. Hmm. Let's pick up the first point about media. Do you not think that some of the wounds are self-inflicted in the media. That some there are people, as you've said, who've just decided that for that access or you know the, the revenue model of media is broken. It's broken in television certainly, unless a big business house comes and runs you. In newspapers too, you're dependent on government advertising. When you and in, and and we have to see how the digital space develops, right? The question is this, if you're going to be dependent on government for advertising, if you're going to be dependent on big business houses because it's still so capital intensive and you haven't moved with technology, can that media be free? You know, the, the problem is that all over the world, there are newspapers and uh, magazines and news television channels you can't tell me that all the channels in, in America are completely free and independent. 
All right, you yeah. know the New York Times is biased. You never see an anti-Israel article in the New York Times. It's very difficult to put out any anti-Israel article in any newspaper in yeah. America. Um, many such instances where I can give you even in England that there is a bias. Uh, so to say that your question was that if the revenue is is broken, is, is media trapped uh, because of politics and political control, or is it trapped because it doesn't know how to make money? But Barka, one thing I do not see in uh, in Western news organizations, I don't see that much of government advertising in the West. Exactly. All right, there's huge government advertising in the West. I mean, today it's difficult to watch the news because if I'm not watching. अरविंद केजरीवाल वो सब अपना 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 फूक मार रहे सो इट्स रियली आई आई डोंट थिंक इट्स अ साइकिल दैट स्टार्टेड ऑन इट्स सेल्फ या and i don't know if there's any future in broadcast channels let's talk about news laundry the media media makes me leads me there you are one of the co-founders of news laundry news laundry started it's now um, a, a kind of you know content platform in general but it started as a place which would critique media and you were breaking this kind of silence in which you know media doesn't talk about media Why did you think of news laundry? What did news laundry mean to you? Why did you get involved with it? I think because of the state of lack of good journalism, lack of journalism, and nobody was pointing it out. You know, like if you look at it today, the kind of uh, uh, programs that are being done, there's very little reporting. Yeah. All right. It's the cheapest thing to do to get ten talking heads and scream at each other. Yeah. It's inexpensive, and to send a story out. Uh, like when Nirbhaya took place, Wall Street Journal sent a reporter with a translator to the village that she was from. It took him like two, three weeks to do that story. It's a remarkable, heartbreaking story where he goes into no Indian journalist or television channel did that. Yeah. So that was the normal way of doing journalism. Yeah. All right. The kind of reporting you did in COVID. Yeah. All right. Were we seeing that? Yeah, some of it, but not with that kind of intensity. Like old journalism, what you were practicing at that time was old journalism. Yeah. You were following the story all over the country. Yeah. Now, uh, that is missing in a in a, so which actually, I see it's what came first. You yeah. know, that is the thing. What came first? We're shooting ourselves in in the foot. We are doing. We think that the only way to get TRPs is to do sensational stuff or shout and scream. I'm not convinced. That these shouting programs are actually getting TRPs. The TRPs, the way they are measured, is all up in the air. It's all a blur. It's a grey area. Nobody knows the truth. Yeah. And somehow marketing, I find marketing people think in boxes, and they think, "Bas yehi chal raha." I don't believe that. I don't. I've never met anyone who watches any of those channels. It's unbearable. I've, I, what we do in the evening is we cruise all the channels. Kya news chal rahi? Acha, wo Bengal ki mar pit ho rahi hai, theek hai. Oh, Manipur ka ye ho gaya. Yo, uh, assembly mein chila chila na bhi. Mm. We done. Then we go to a movie. Why did you leave news laundry? Uh, as I said to you earlier, it was at my age. I'm 77 now. So two years ago, I decided I did not want to. Uh, spend the last lap of my career because obviously it is to just wake up in the morning and check every story and check every uh, word that's written and every bit of footage because one wrong could be defamatory and uh, yeah. you know seditious. It could be anything and telling people to wait for the other side. The young people are very impatient these days. They don't understand that wait for twenty four hours, wait for forty hours. You're writing a negative story about someone. At least give him a chance. Yeah. So. Constantly arguing that give that person a chance to so all this I felt was a waste of my time at this age. I would I have done it in the past in my life in in my career where I happily did it, but at this stage I wanted to see a uh, right with a larger perspective look look at the larger horizon of where we're going, what we're at, and the kind of 
quick one-off things that people writing like 400 words, 500 words, I don't think they're worth it. This argument in the workspace today, it is really an intergenerational argument and it isn't just in media, it's, it's almost everywhere, but in media particularly. Uh, people come into media wanting to be this side or that side. It's, it's how should we handle it as people from a different generation? You're saying this side of the meaning or left or right? Yeah. You know, there was a time when I remember when you're hiring, I remember Arun, when Arun, my brother was hiring, he would check which, like, is he affiliated to anybody? Yeah. Is he a Congress person or is he a BJP person or is he whichever person? Because you didn't want to touch anyone with a political affiliation. But right? even he would not be able to do that today in all honesty, right? Like the point is that the media landscape has changed so much. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> wow. No, I'm just seeing, How I'm just seeing the India Today right? empire from afar and saying that I, I, I think today it's almost encouraged. And, you know, even their tagline, they have a promo, which I've seen, which is, oh, we have all the sides. That's how they're saying, like, we have this side, that's it. They're not actually saying don't have a side. Hmm. So I'm just wondering, how does one handle it? How should one handle it? How do you handle bias you know, in the process of a story? Even in the old days, even when I was uh, editor of News Track, for example, if I saw someone who was biased in either direction, yeah, I wouldn't allow it. Okay, I would just say this is not working for us. Yeah. Now Manoj Raghuvanshi, who at that time, since then he has changed his mind. At that time was a big BJP bhakt. Yeah. And he was sent to cover the demolition in Ayodhya. When I came back and saw the story, I called him in. Because normally when he would do a story, there'd be a one-hour argument on what I was going to change because it would be very biased. When I looked at it, I said, Kya hua? Why is it not all gung-ho, pro-BJP and Hindutva and all that? Kya hua? You, you've done a balanced story. I was surprised. I said, how have you done a balanced story? It's <laughs> <laughs> so a big question. Uh, uh, he said, Madhu, pehla dharma hai journalism. Dusra dharma baad mein so when it comes to a story like that, the, he knew I was not going to tolerate a celebration of it yeah. or a running down of it. It had to be done as pure reportage. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's something that we've lost. But we've also lost it. We've lost it for sure. But, you know, a, a recent Reuters Institute report tells you that most people, and this is not just true for India, it's globally true, are today getting their information and their journalism from non-journalists, from influencers, from Instagram influencers, from a 22-year-old young man who, who is, you know, doing his research and giving you one video a week, from satirists, from stand-up comics. Is journalism... Are journalists a dying breed? Could be. I mean, unless they re we reinvent ourselves, unless we deal with, like you were talking to me about AI, yeah. unless we deal with all the new stuff, and I think it's very exciting. It is. I mean, I'm not one of those people. I have many of my contemporaries who say, oh, lovely days, the old days. <laughs> I said, what old days? We used to have to go to do one story to do research. I had to go to Times of India, sneak into their library to find clippings. Today at the so I'm not nostalgic yeah. about the old days at all. Yeah. But I think unless we reinvent ourselves completely, and I think that's true in every profession. If you're not reinventing yourself as an actor, as a playwright, as a doctor, if you're not looking at new developments and incorporating them in your career or your professionalism, it's never going to work. More now now more than ever, we really have journalists have to reinvent themselves. What has been your most difficult assignment? I don't think anything was difficult. Is there one that you look back at that you would have done differently today? Yes. Which one? There was one, um, uh, there was Saeed Modi, the husband of this Amita, who's now married to Sanjay Singh, was murdered. Yes, the badminton player. Yes. And um, our reporter went and interviewed the prosecutor. Hmm. And he was drunk. The prosecutor or the yeah. reporter? No. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Who was drunk? The prosecutor. Prosecutor was mm. drunk. Mm. And um, 
he said all kinds of self incriminatory things mm. all right and really bad stuff and manoj came back and i said i said good we have to show this like this is what he's doing and um, so it was an it was a a murder investigation would have just gone downhill if we showed that i mean it would have gone downhill maybe would have corrected it yeah that it would have then gone better if yeah. we shown it yeah this guy started calling me up the next day his wife his college going children they showed up in my office crying ble- pleading begging please phir se kar do ye hamari zindagi khara ho jayegi kids are threatening to commit suicide and all that. and i succumbed yeah i said chalo phir se kar i shouldn't have why he was not in control just let me argue the other side he was not in control of what he was saying because he was drunk yes but he may not have been in control when he's in court yes fair All right fair. and said modi had lost his life and he fair. was entitled to justice mm. so if we had shown that tape mm. we would have exposed the fact that said modi's murder was not being was there's no hope of getting justice for the man like this interesting so that is a mistake i made interesting let's talk in the last uh, few minutes that we have about being a woman in journalism uh and i have before i come to how difficult or not it has been one of your very intriguing some would say provocative pieces was on the me too movement where you said it's become a pop culture moment and you said uh, like i i i think you wrote it for news laundry itself and you said yes it's good that women are speaking after all this while it's good that men are being held to account it's good that men are being cautious but you compared the indian me too movement with what had happened with how uh, it had been reported in let's say america where you said months were spent on that story on corroborating cross checking whereas here anonymous online yes accounts were being republished as fact yes was there something about the me too movement that made you uncomfortable and is there something in it that you still found empowering at the same time was it a paradox no, i don't moment? believe it i don't need empowerment i don't need i you I, may not but maybe yeah, other women no, do i think okay fine but that word makes me a little okay nervous. what's the word uh, i'd say enabling all right mm-hmm. um i'll tell you what happened when you read the kind of work that the new york times and um, ronan farrow ronan farrow ronan farrow did, did for yeah. the new yorker uh and, and in fact even he struggled first when he got tried to get it published he finally had to give it to the new yorker but the nbc msnbc didn't publish it or whatever he was yeah weinstein's you know clout was working at yeah. that time yeah so all over the world journalists faced this thing that you're going to be shut down the kind of work the the checking double checking the uh, getting evidence making sure that the act, people who were women who were accusing the person of whatever they were accusing of there was proof of it there were witnesses of it and in india what in india what we were seeing was that people random like a woman tweeted about an artist mm-hmm. that he uh, i can't remember the exact words and i don't want to say the wrong words but she basically accused him yeah of sexually assaulting her now there was no proof there was no investigation there was no nothing happened other than he lost all his gallery work his paintings were not being sold he was down and out completely because this girl decided to write a tweet i'm okay for empowerment i'm okay for um, you know bringing out in open if you've been assaulted but you can't do it randomly and then l- later it turned out when it was investigated by the artist and his family when they confronted her she said was sab kar rahe to maine socha main bhi kar lo hmm but so you can destroy so there is see you can't get into an uh, a, a situation with me to making into an anti men movement no i it get can't that be. but the whole concept of me to and i'm not i understand its limitations and its problems but the whole concept of me too was that the courts and the legal process had failed women so you could not always go the route of the courts and there had to be a space where women could talk about what had happened to women now in principle do you think that that's if you don't like the word empowering that's a powerful moment 
No, I don't see how the courts failed women because Look there have been women in Look India. Look at Bhavri Devi. There have been there have been women in India who filed cases against men who assaulted them in Bollywood and various other things. For example, uh, one of the Me Too cases that eventually did show up in court, um, M J Akbar's. But it showed up in court because he sued exactly Priya Ramani. The point is, but had Priya Ramani sued him first? She just put it in an article. So you're saying the courts failed the women. The courts, how many women can you say actually f- filed the case and then lost it because there was a anti-women or a non? I mean, I can think of Bhavri Devi. One of the first assignments I did. Yeah. She's, it's more than 30 years she hasn't got a conviction and she, her case gave us the Vishakha guidelines her case right. gave us the you know the posh guidelines that are now mandatory there are many articles that support what you're saying such as those rapists who were let off alright on bail that's true the Bilkis Bano rapists yes. who were given remission yes but and in Bihar the yeah. Nitish Kumar government did the same yeah. thing so this but you know in many cases um, I think looking at it case by case is important because uh there are many genuine cases where women have, uh, the woman has not got justice and it's been a problem. But there are many cases where the woman hasn't done any, uh, gone through any legal methods, hasn't told anyone, nothing has happened and suddenly one day just says, I'm going to tweet this. Mm. That's not fair. Mm. But women could argue, the women who have done this could argue that it is our choice how we want to you know, we know that if we go to court, it is going to take us the next 10 years, 15 years of our life. Maybe we don't want a double jeopardy in our lives in terms of first having been harassed, then having to, to spend this time. That was the whole concept of the Me Too movement. Ah, but Barkha, listen, how would you react if an, somebody, say your brother or husband or boyfriend or somebody, is accused by a random woman which is completely fake? And it's her right to just tweet it out and say he assaulted me. Tomorrow, a, a, anyone, a, prof, uh, uh, a student in a, in a university can say, that I went in for my tutorial and this professor assaulted me. It's her word against his. All right. Yeah. Uh, say um, a nurse can say a doctor assaulted me or a patient assaulted me. Mm-hmm. All right. I don't think that's the way to go about it. In the Akbar case, there were 20 this women. A tweet uh, with a random accusation. To me, is not right. In the Akbar case, because of which he eventually, you know, left the cabinet, left the government, there were 20 women. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't know if we can look at it and say they all, none of them went to court and therefore what they said doesn't count. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that what happened in Akbar's case, there was obviously uh, a, a story that was being built. And I, I am surprised that he filed the case because I don't know who advised him, because if anyone would tell him that all that happened would happen. Yes. But the point is that what I'm saying is fine. Women have this recourse to to complain or do which, take whichever path they want to. What I'm saying is that you can't destroy a man who's innocent because a random woman just decides to tweet something and everyone believes it. I'll tell you, I'm not comfortable with anonymity in this in, in this particular case, especially if the legal route is not being uh, followed. You're not comfortable. I'm not comfortable yeah. with anonymity. I, personally, I, I, I feel like if you are going to make such a serious accusation about you somebody, you should, you should sort of say, this is who I am. Unless you're going the legal route and then the law says you can't identify yeah. somebody who's a survivor of sexual assault. But in the Akbar case, I mean, I should say that I, I was one of those who went to court when Priya Ramani was sued just to show solidarity because I thought it was terrible that she had been sued. And I looked at the Akbar case and I felt very, I, I, I felt like there were many more women who had possibly experienced this who hadn't come out. And now are we going to say... There's a story there which I cannot talk about. Okay. It's invasion of somebody else's privacy. So all I can say is what the artist said, not everything about is the way it appears to be. Okay, let's let's agree to disagree on this one because I think it's a case by case issue. I think definitely there are there are men who have overstepped bounds with people in their workforce in every field, whichever field you look at. And I think definitely they should be held accountable. And I would support any woman who does that. 
but I cannot support a woman who randomly decides that I'm going to get this guy for either being or being fired. I'm going to say he assaulted me or he, you know, ditch has an affair with him and ditches her. And then she files a assault case. So it's and it yeah. has to be done. Yeah, of course. Like in fact, one of the things when 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 judges even admit cases where there's a promise of marriage and then marriage doesn't happen and it's called you know it's filed as a rape case. That's a complete trivialization of what what women go through. So let's 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 park this and agree to disagree on this one and move on. And I want I want to end with what it means to be a woman in media. And I ask this with. I ask this recognizing the conflict that this question poses because I think for me personally I've always struggled with wanting to be degendered and then recognizing that actually the responses to me and they could be both good or bad are not degendered so if I go to Kargil or I cover covid or I go to cover Kashmir there is extra recognition for being a woman at the front line but there is also the resentment that comes with a successful woman. So it, it kind of both things happen. So even if you want to say, okay, just judge me on my work. What does it have to do with being a woman in the media? That's not real life. In real life, being a woman matters. Mm. How has it been for you? You know, quite honestly, um, Barkha, it's never, my gender has never been an issue to me. Yeah. Even if other people see it. But as, has it been an issue to other people? I don't know. It doesn't affect me. I mean, I've never gone into any job thinking I'm going to do this as a woman editor or as a woman journalist. I've never thought that. I've never. So I am always uncomfortable when I'm invited to and I usually refuse. Uh, a women's any, conclave or a yeah, women's. gender this thing and gender that thing. My attitude is very old school in that. Mm -hmm. So shut up and get on with it. But women had to fight to get in. To yeah, first, so in the first place. Did puff. And to get assignments. Yes, of course. But then the... You know, usko bada issue bana bana ke, it's, to me it's a ball. Mm. All right, we all go through difficult times, many of different kinds. There are women who fight the worst odds ever and come out winners with everything, all the chips down and everything not working against them, being slapped down after everything. The worst poverty, educating themselves, those kind of stories, I mean, they're all there. The point is that I just cannot, I apologize, I cannot connect uh, with this like gender fight. Of course, if there's uh, something about domestic abuse and even that, I'll say, look, you, the old cliche that you got uh, abused uh, by your husband or man once, the second time is your fault for being there. I really believe that whether you're a man or a woman, you have to take charge of your life, your choices. Is, 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 is that not simplistic? Sorry? Is that not simplistic? In the sense that there well, are women who Jean can't... Paul, that means Jean-Paul Sartre was simplistic. No, because no that's but I'm saying if you look at the fact that some women, some women don't walk out of abusive relationships because they're economically dependent and they were never given that freedom to be... I get that. I get right? That. Others are conditioned into thinking that marriage is is everything and a woman outside of marriage is judged. So yeah. is, is it simple to say, okay, the next, okay, the first time you say he won't do it the next time, the next time he does it, if, it, if you don't walk out, the fault is yours. Is it simplistic to say that? Isn't it simplistic? You're saying it's simplistic. I don't think so. I, I, and I'm pushing you to say there could be issues of economic autonomy, social there conditioning. Be, there could be. There could be. There is. It's not easy. Uh, it's, it's never easy to survive in a situation like that. Uh, but you're looking at somebody who's beaten so badly that she could die. Yeah. All right. And today there are many places of refuge that women are taken who are being abused. And... Um, so I think there are choices that women have to be made aware of. And frankly, I find this whole gender business I don't identify with, hmm. quite frankly. It's, um, Is that because it's never been a fight for you? It's always been a fight for me. Hmm. From the time I was at, I mean, when I wanted to go and study abroad, my mother said, Arun, you are studying something, why are you that. Then why do you say what you do? Because I, it was my fight. I, I don't understand this, that I have to universalize this, my fight to the world. No, but you didn't go abroad to study because you were female and Arun was no, male. No, I did go, I fought. I fought, but it wasn't approved of. Everything that I did in my profession was disapproved of, but I did it. And even as a journalist, you're given silly assignments. 
you know, fashion, yay, woe, everything, even in America. So we all go through it. You didn't, you, you came at a much later stage where women were already doing things. No, Your I mother had covered the war. She had covered the war for 30 years later, I still had to fight to get that assignment. Exactly. So, you know, so fighting is a, is a, is a daily, uh, daily process. You know, I was 12 years old. I told you this before. Tell me. When when your mother came to my cousin's birthday party and yeah. I was there. And your mom was there with her golden plait <laughs> in silver kameez and light eyes. And what she had greeny blue eyes, no? Yes. And this lovely tawny skin. And she's telling my cousin that she'd just come from some newspaper, I think it was the Statesman, where Kuldeep Nair was the editor or something. She applied for a job yeah. and he, she was telling the story that he said, we don't hire women. Yes, I, that's the story I grew up yeah. on. So she was telling that and when I heard her, that was my thing, like I want to be a journalist. If she can, yeah, yeah. she was like older than me. Yes, of course. So, uh, I, it's a, str look, it's a struggle for people who have the wrong surname. All right. If you, I know people in offices who have told me privately that I have changed my name. If I knew that I am a low-caste, I would not be able to do it. And I would not be able to sit in their canteen. Mein, 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 mein. Okay? So you can, have, you can have that struggle. You can, women have so many struggles in terms of not only jobs or whatever and survival, abuse, mm -hmm. fear of safety or whatever. Uh, I mean, there's a whole list of things that every person in any part of the world has at some point in their lives been challenged because and they have to struggle. So, so, so let me end with asking you, what is that phase in your life which has been of acute struggle professionally where you said, no, everybody gets slap down and you get up, you scrape your knees and you get up and you say, I'll fight another day. Do you have a memory of a phase, a story, an assignment, a couple of years, a few months, where it just felt like, like shit? No. Because it never felt that bad or because you were mentally stronger than that? I don't feel bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky I'm you. sorry. <laughs> things like, uh, I'll tell you that times that made me angry. There were times when I, when I was sabotaged, hmm. you know, and I'm very bad at... Sabotaged uh, by? Uh, by, like in office. Okay, right? okay. I'm bad at office politics. I don't know what somebody's done to me until hmm. after the fact. Yeah. Oh, so that's what he did. Yeah. So yeah, there have been times where I've been angry that uh, some somebody's undermining me or lying about me and sab actually sabotaging yeah. me. Yeah. And there was one woman who sabotaged... I did an interview with uh, Advani and um, it was an okay interview and the woman was, an, uh, was a chamcha of Advani working in Doordarshan. Yeah. She'd been appointed by Doordarshan, yeah. by Advani in Doordarshan yeah. and she censored his story. He was not in power at that time, Congress was in power and she censored that story to the Congress's liking. Mm. And then when Advani objected, I said, I didn't do it. She did. She blamed me. Mm. And he believed her. He believed her because she and was did you ever, by him. So did you ever why would he believe Madhu? Did you ever tell him later? I told him then. Okay. I told him then, right then. I said, I did not edit it. Another time, somebody close to a politician, we were they were in jail. And uh, yeah, Advani was in jail. So we were negotiating how to interview them in jail. Mm. And the guy who was going to help us with the interview was this guy's assistant who wanted a PCR player. That made me angry. Yeah. Okay. There were many situations where uh, you get blamed for something. Which, which you haven't done. Which you haven't done. That infuriates me. Those were my, my struggles and challenges. And that has happened to me many, many, many times. That's something that I haven't done gets palmed off onto me. But it doesn't make you angry or bitter? It makes me angry then. But you don't carry it with you? Maybe, I don't know. I, I, when you talk to me about it, it comes back. But it's not sitting in my heart forever. I'm too busy. Okay. Do a, do a forecast for me. If three years from now we're having this conversation, where do you think the state of Indian media might be? Oh my God, it could be Disney World. We have no idea. It could be Avatar. <laughs> 
This could be anything. I mean, I don't think journalists should predict anything. But if one is to be optimistic, I think it should be that. Uh, I I can't say that's how it will be, but I could say I'd like it to be that we have total freedom to write without any and write or uh, publish with responsibility because obviously there have been yes uh, stuff published which is really uh, wrong, planted, erroneous, you know all that. Um, I think I'm really hoping that journalism journalism has come full circle. It's become so bad. That can only get better from here. Yes, it has to. The people are now waking up. Yeah. That you can't watch that those kind of Godi media channels. You can't read rubbish that people. And even when you're listening to the speeches, I see an element of cynicism. Well, I think that that's something to think about. That what do you think? Where do you think we'll be in journalism? I I agree with you. I think it's impossible to forecast because the convergence of technological changes, the changes in the audience. uh the fact that people are getting their content from non journalists this is uh, i think an existential challenge for journalism as we understand it and i think the only thing that might work is classic storytelling but in new formats mm but you know you new formats you can't be wedded to the old way of telling a story but people have to still be able to and i think in covid that's what happened people saw an attempt to transcend bjp congress and tell the story of people and i think if you go back to telling the story of people maybe just maybe people will start consuming content again i don't know but i want to say thank you uh from news track to news laundry and so many other stories in between may you keep telling stories and thank you so much for talking to us all the best to you and i hope to see more stories on absolutely the absolutely thank you so much